So a lot of you have asked about the history of this core pad thing. So I just want to fill you in a little bit on um, how it evolved and, and why it evolved, to tell you the truth. One of the biggest things that you'll notice as you explore mechanics of the spine is that individuals have varying degrees of range of motion. And if most of your exercises are on something flat, you know, a bench or a floor or something, like in group exercise, then you have very limited ability to explore range and to progress range. Now, first thing I ask people to do in class at RTS is to start thinking of range of motion not in terms of that um, grossly defined watching the body bend around, but think of it in terms of what are the available joint positions, in this case the vertebral bodies and the spinal facets, and what is their availability within a given individual collectively from top to bottom, and what are the associated contractile lengths, because that's really, that's really what you're training is you're improving the contractile ability, the tension development, at various lengths. So progressing up to various starting lengths of, you know, a little bit longer and progressing slowly without throwing it with inertia to a little bit shorter, it's a pretty smart idea with progression being the key word and recognizing that the goal of the exercise is not to be necessarily out there training a movement, but to be improving contractile ability, tension production, and those are different things. So, um, when we would work with patients in physical therapy and clients who half the time act like patients because they have back problems, um, it became obvious that the ball was a terrible place to start people on crunches. Now if you're going, oh my god, that's sacrilege, the ball's the best tool in the world, then, then you drank some Kool-Aid, and uh, uh, proverbial Kool-Aid, and, uh, and you haven't looked at the biomechanical realities of working with real people. Fit people can do lots of things. Fit people should not pretend that everybody else can do what they can do. And to impose those kinds of ideas is, well, it's, it's the closest thing, closest thing to malpractice we could have in the exercise industry. So we're paying attention to the, to the individual and we're letting their body decide everything for us. The answers are within them. This is going to be client-defined and client-defined range, client-defined progression. And the first version of this, I wanted to be progressive it's intentionally getting off the ball where you have to control side to side and even some people have trouble getting from a seated position down into a supine position to do a crunch. The ball is terrible for side bends, although people do it. It's a terrible tool because you spend all your time trying to stay on the ball and people go, that's the whole point. Realize when you're trying to stay on the ball, you're down regulating your output or your tension production in the area you're really trying to challenge here. And so um, just that idea of juggling so many things and self-preservation not falling being priority, uh, we really downplay the strengthening by having that big wobbly thing. So that's why the goal of the exercise is important. Learning the learning, uh, motor learning of dealing with the ball is a cool thing to learn, but it's later and we need to work on tension development and control earlier. So as we go from somebody lying flat it's a bad idea to just to shove something big and round underneath them. So we need to work our way up. This was my first version. This is, I don't know, it's almost 20 years old by now. It's pretty chewed up. But it was just foam. I didn't have anything to wrap it in. And uh, here was the problem with this one. We learned really rapidly that it wasn't just about filling in the lumbar spine. And I see that on a lot of machines. They'll put a curve in there, but it'll only span the lumbar part. And I gotta tell you, as much as you may think or have learned the thoracic area is really limited, and it may be in a nine-year-old, but if we're looking at availability, a crunch is primarily performed through the thoracic region um, with the bottom five vertebrae in the lumbar region, not really providing, they're moving in the sagittal plane, they're just not providing as much as you might think uh, compared to the thoracic. But it's a collective thing, bottom line, it's collective from the top of the thoracic to, to down near the, you know, the, end of the, the end of the lumbar. So when we use this thing for progression and started with a small curve, it didn't span much of the spine, top to bottom. So it was, it was not um, helpful because um, there, there were parts just still sitting on the tape. It, it's just not, it's not, it wasn't a good progression. It was easy to make because they just took a dome and sliced straight through it. It was easier to make. Didn't work well at all. So, epic fail. This is the more recent version and it's, it's a little bit different. You're going to see that it still has six levels like the original one, but it is encased in vinyl. So it's just easier to clean and all that stuff. You'll also notice that each 
concentric, each, each layer is concentrically shaped and puzzle piece like, meaning each one is a slightly different arc or built on a slightly different radius. So they fit together like a puzzle. And there's a second feature here that I really find valuable. Number one, uh, you'll see that there's a section of inner uh, wrapping that's Velcroed also. But it's like, a, it's like a base unit. It's like something that these can be placed upon so they don't slide around much. They can't do this when you're trying to wrap them up later. So that's kind of cool that we've got this, this relatively uh, stable dome on which to fit the next puzzle piece. But you'll also notice that, and the reason there's two in here, because honestly through lots and lots and lots of years of trying this, most people can come in and start on level two. You know, it squishes a little bit, it's a little bit comfortable and it gives. So, so it's not quite the dome that it looks like. But um, you can if you need to. It was a lot of back patients that I had over, over uh, the history of this thing that really needed to go down to, to level one. And that works out really well. We can just wrap that up. And there's your most basic level. And you're, most people, I know, you're sitting out there going, who would need that? Well, if you have a broad spectrum of clients coming to see you, and not just a bunch of people who are in shape, then you're going to end up needing that at some point. And of course, the cool thing is we can go back here, <coughs> and and I, you know, there's a video on the, on here also about specifically wrapping it up and everything in case you're struggling with that at all. But now you've got this great progression um, from one to two, which is where most people would either start or maybe even stay if they have lots of lots of issues or even small issues with their spine um, and probably most of the this is the starting place for, for crunches and uh, we'll do another video later for specific exercises and positioning people over this because it changes based on their range of motion and some other things and how difficult you want to make it this level three and level four will be a progression probably max for most people doing a crunch if you still want to get the potential for their shoulders and their butt to be on the table or on the floor. So working up to here is pretty common for regular crunches. Don't feel like the higher the number the better because it's about what's appropriate for the individual. We got to get off of this more is better thing. And that's the same thing with the ball. They think the wobblier it is, the harder it is, the better it is. Depends on the goal. Depends on the individual and where they've progressed. Now this five and six thing, I'll tell you where I use that the most. Very rarely, almost never, for crunches. But they end up being really nice for things like side bends. And occasionally, if I don't have anything else, this is the place to start a back extension. Lying face down on the floor for a back extension makes no sense. Lying on your side on the floor makes no sense for a side bend because you're already bent into the range you're trying to perform. There's no place to go. So this is a progressively increasing starting range into, for example, right side bending as we move into left side bending for strengthening. This is a pretty cool thing to use. Yes, there are some people that are really long in the trunk and really uh, kind of in shape where their shoulders are broad and they're, uh, they sometimes need more than this. This is, a, this is a kind of a default place to start and it works for easily 90% of the people, 90, 95% of the people that, that we see in and out of, of this facility. Um, so anyway, that's the history of it. That's the why. And, um, and when you might use some of these things. And like I said, please explore uh, some other videos that we've got on the specifics of setup and the specifics of manipulating the wrapping sequence.